title of our study or discussion this afternoon. The title is The Leaven of the Pharisees. And in looking at the leaven of the Pharisees, we'll be looking at some things that uh, quite possibly might be a little bit challenging, a little bit close to heart uh, as we listen. But before we get into that, there's something that you quickly discover living in this world, planet Earth. We live in a world that is full of fakery and cheap imitations. Isn't that right? For almost every single genuine article or product or item out there, there is some fake, cheap copy that looks like it, promises to act like it at a fraction of the price. And uh, that's very tempting. How many times have you bought an item uh, because it was really a good deal? And, you th and inside you hoped that it would do the job of the more expensive one and you quickly discover that uh, there is a reason why it is so cheap imitation copy fakery it's kind of the the mark of the world we live in not just on items or, or, or products and and that's especially the case if it's a if it's an item that's popular or in demand or a product that is really uh, selling very well you'll find multitudes of imitations Unfortunately, one time I got caught out, not just one time, and uh, despite our better judgment sometimes, and you go and you think, no, this time it'll be okay, and, and we went and bought this item, and, and we didn't even use it once. We threw it away. So the ability to be able to tell the genuine from the fake is an important one to develop. Some cases it's easier than others. With some products, it's really hard to know that this is an imitation or a deception. And you won't find out, perhaps, even until you use it for a while, and then you learn that you were actually deceived. And that's not a fun thing to do. So sometimes we can tell the fake, other times we cannot. In our spiritual experience, there are a lot of fakes, spurious, make-believe, ingenuine. The Bible warns us about a number of fake things to watch out for. We are to beware of false gods, right? False prophets, false Christs. As a matter of fact, we're told there is another Jesus, another gospel. False brethren, false teachers, false apostles, and even Satan, who appears as an angel of light. In the spiritual realm, as part of the faith, we are warned that there is a lot of fakery, isn't that right? And in our spiritual experience, it is vital and important to be able to tell the fake from the genuine, because unlike an item that might not work very well, in the spiritual judgment and in the spiritual world, not being able to tell the false might result in disastrous results to your destiny, to your walk with the Lord. And so it is vital to be able to tell the fake from the real. A very dangerous deception is present in our Christian walk. And this is what I want to address today. And this deception has to do with the fake and the genuine. How is your faith? How is your experience? How is your Christian walk? Is it the real article? Or is it a look-alike? That's a very important question to ask because honestly, I believe this is one of the biggest problems we have today. It's a prevalent, pervasive problem. Very hard to detect, but we'll see what the Lord says about it. But before we go there, let's, let's look at an easy one to pick. There is an easy fake aspect to Christianity. And James talks about it. This one's pretty easy to pick. James chapter 2. James chapter 2, and we'll look at verses 14 down to 17. James chapter 2, verses 14 down to 17. And here the, uh, the apostle tells us, 
What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he have faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and fill. Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? Verse 17, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. This is the easy one to tell. Faith, of course, without works is dead. dead. A Christian who only makes a profession without corresponding behavior and conduct is very obviously a, a fake. And that's not that hard to pick because all you have to do is look at the works. Now, my purpose here today is not to see if you can pick that in others. That's usually our tendency. We're usually pretty good at that. But let's look at ourselves, okay? Are these elements in part of your Christian experience and behavior? That's something we need to look at, we need to explore, because that is a real deception. James is addressing a deception that does exist. A profession without corresponding work, or without a true manifestation. What it is, it's not faith versus works, by the way. It's genuine faith versus faith, uh, fake faith. Genuine faith is a working one. A mere profession of faith without any manifestation is not really faith at all. And like I said, this is the easy one. I want to get to the hard one in a minute. But just like, like we just read, helping those in need. Controlling the tongue. James talks about controlling the tongue. Visiting orphans and widows. Being unspotted from the world. Even our relationships with each other. These are elements of that working, genuine faith that is what a Christian is all about. Are these things part of your experience? And if they're not uh, part of someone's experience, then you might, rightly so, wonder if they're only making a profession. It's fairly easy to see. Even Jesus said it, you know. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not the things that I say? In 2 Corinthians 13, if we turn there, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. The apostle gives us an injunction here. And it's part of our Christian duty. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Paul says, Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except he be reprobates? When was the last time you examined yourself as a Christian. When you took your spiritual pulse. How often do we do that? Unfortunately, and it's something that we, we ought to do often. Unfortunately, perhaps we don't do it as often as we should. When did you last turn a critical eye on yourself? And really, truly examined yourself? That's the question. You know, failure and neglect to do that can become a very serious problem. What does it mean to be in the faith? He says, examine yourself. See whether you are in the faith. So what we sometimes do is check. Well, I believe the state of the dead. And I believe in the Sabbath. I get an extra tick because I believe in the truth about God. And we examine our beliefs. This is not examining yourself whether you're in the faith. That's part of it. But that's not the whole of it. But all too often we look at our doctrines. We look at our beliefs. We look at what we stand for. Present truth. Three angels' messages. And we conclude, well, I am in the faith because I believe all these things. And we fail, brothers and sisters, to go to the true, genuine heart examination. Because despite believing in all these things, there still remains a problem. How do you examine yourself? How do you examine your own heart? There's something that goes a lot deeper. And in not going deep enough, brothers and sisters, we can end up with a look-alike faith, a look-alike experience, thinking that it is the true. Hopefully, as we shall see. Now, there's another danger that, that stems from the first one. We looked at 
a profession without corresponding behavior or works. But there is another problem, a more insidious manifestation of false faith. This one is really hard to pick. And James mentions it, James chapter 2. Let's read this verse first, and then we'll go to another thing, that, another verse that brings it out even clearer. James chapter 2 and verse 20. We have quite a number of verses from the book of James today. James chapter 2 and verse 20. And here the apostle says the familiar words. James 2 and verse 20. And he says, But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is? Is dead. Well, we all know that. We read that earlier. But I want you to think about something. Is the inverse also true? If faith without works is dead, is it possible to have works without faith? Is that possible? Oh, yes, some people say. You know, we know all about that, right? And if it's possible, then would that also be vain? But we have a problem because this one is so much harder to pick. Why? Because it is not apparent. It is not visible. It is more subtle. This actually deals with a deep heart issue. It's something that's so much harder to pick. So much so that it actually is very possible for the owner of such a situation to end up being self-deceived. And this is why the apostle says you need to examine yourselves whether you're being the faith. Be honest, be true, be genuine in that examination. And for all our good efforts at, at such an examination, you can still come out with the wrong result. You realize that? We actually need divine help, divine illumination to examine our hearts all right. Brothers and sisters, this is a very serious problem among us. I know that, not because someone told me that, but it's something that Jesus identified. Let's go to Luke 12. This is where the title of this study comes from. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, verse 1. Luke 12, 1. In the meantime, when they were gathered together, an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Picture the scene. Here is Jesus, crowds of people, so many of them that they're trampling each other. That would be a good problem to have at camp, right? You would say, oh, that's a good camp. So many people come. And in the midst of that, in the midst of this success, in the midst of this apparent prosperity of the cause, Christ turns to his disciples. It says, first of all, and he tells them something. He tells them to watch out for something. It is something called the leaven of the Pharisees, which is what? Hypocrisy. That does not seem to fit with the situation that is happening around them. He doesn't tell them, look, we're doing well. Go get some more seats. Go organize the people to sit together. The disciples were feeling all these successes that were happening. Things were going well. They're with Jesus. More people are coming. And in the midst of that, he tells them, I want you to watch out for something. The leaven of the Pharisees, that is hypocrisy. Brothers and sisters, according to the Lord, this is a danger for us as well, the disciples of Christ. What is the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy? What does hypocrisy mean? Okay, say one thing, do another. If you look up the meaning, you'll actually find that it is, it means an actor under an assumed role, like a stage play. A hypocrite is one who pretends who acts. And what that is, is basically, you are one thing, but you appear to be another thing. And this was the main problem with the Pharisees. And Jesus warns that this is an, a problem that can infect his followers. And like leaven, it's invisible, but it's insidious and it spreads. And he says, you need to watch out for that. This is a very real danger. 
a very real, real problem where you would have the appearance of a true genuine Christian with all the works that we have listed but in reality you are not a possessor of a genuine Christian experience now that's hard to pick and Jesus says this is a very serious and very real problem hypocrisy is practicing deception notice how Jesus puts it in Matthew 23 and I really want you to examine your own heart as we look at that Matthew 23 and verse 27 and 28 Matthew 23 27 and 28 Woe unto you, Jesus says, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Jesus gave some of his most scathing rebukes in this chapter to the Pharisees, right? But then he also told his disciples, we just read, watch out for that disease. Watch out for that condition, this leaven of the Pharisees, lest it infect you as well. It's a very real danger where we can be appearing as righteous before men, but within full of hypocrisy and iniquity. And that is very difficult to tell. Because on the outside, all you see is a very good believer who believes all the right doctrines, who looks the part, who acts the part, who might do many good things. And possibly because of doing all these many good things, there might be a certain sense of assurance that I must be doing it right, otherwise God would not bless. Maybe people coming to the camp, so many people coming to the camp, that's taken as sign and evidence that all well, things must be right. God is blessing. And this is the danger, brothers and sisters, or whatever it might be in your case, where the outside looks good, but the problem is the inside. When was the last time you took a really good, close, hard look at yourself? You know, I know sometimes talking about something like this, I'm talking about the Pharisees. If I were to ask you the question, do you know anyone like that today? I'm sure most of you put your hand up. You know Brother X and Sister Y, and, and you, you are certain that they are really not genuine, true Christians. Isn't that right? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. But genuinely think, yeah, I wish Brother X, oh, I, I hope he's listening to what this brother is saying. I hope he's listening. I know someone who really needs to hear this message, right? I'm talking about you, not them. I'm talking to you. We are so prone, brothers and sisters, to judge others and examine others and sit in that judgment seat and neglect to look at our own heart. Because we checked, we, last time I checked, I believed the truth. I helped someone on the way to camp. How recent is that? There you go. And we fail at looking at the real heart issues. Because to be honest, and a number of brethren have addressed this. We have quite a number of problems among us. We might think they're doctrinal problems. I personally believe we have heart problems among us. Honestly. And not, not minor ones, some serious ones. Very serious ones. And that is a blight upon God's people. It is really nothing other than what Jesus had warned his disciples about. We have a rampant infestation of leaven, which is hypocrisy. Among those who profess to believe the truth. And this, brothers and sisters, I believe is the cause, the root cause of so many other things that we wonder about, that we struggle with, that don't even make sense to us in all the different circumstances that arise. So are you like that? 
A Christian movie is not something you watch on TV or in the cinema with a Christian theme to it. Many times a Christian movie is what we play among our brethren. You realize that this, this thing, Jesus called it leaven. Leaven spreads, you know, the, the nature of leaven. He's using that. It spreads. Many times our Christian experience is colored by the person who brought us to the truth. Whether it be a speaker or whether it be a brother or a sister, they have a certain measure of influence. And observing, and many, I notice that many times people come into the church and because the church, sadly but truly, many times has these pretentious Christians. The new believer comes in and starts learning and thinking, well, to be a Christian is to do this and behave this way without really examining the true heart motives because behind the scenes, there's all manner of heart issues that happen. And they really never learn to become a true, genuine Christian. They learn to become a Christian movie, an actor. I know what that's like for a number of years, growing up in the church. Where people go into the church and look at a certain thing, but outside there is a totally different life. You know what I'm talking about? Now, someone might say, well, that's pretty obvious, brother. We're not like that. No, we're, we're human, so we refine these things and we we make it more difficult to detect without really sometimes addressing the problem. So how is your experience? How is my experience? Do we have the leaven of Pharisees in our hearts? Do we sometimes play the part of a Christian? Because we know the Bible says we should do this, or we should say this, or we should behave this way. And we do that because we know we should, but in our heart is a totally different story. Have you ever been like that? Don't answer. Jesus said, be careful. That attitude can spread. It can spread in your, in your own heart. And it can spread to others. And it causes a very, very serious disaster. What does it mean to be a Christian? What is the meaning of that? A Christian is not one that is defined by his beliefs, believe it or not. It's not. Because you can believe all the right things, but still not be a Christian, right? So the beliefs is not it. Now don't get me wrong, the beliefs have their place, and they are important. But that's not what defines and makes a Christian. You might be uh, saying, well, no, of course it's not the beliefs. It's, it's the conduct and the behavior, right? How we behave. But that can be faked, right? You can behave like a good Christian, but in your heart, there is a problem. So your conduct and behavior is not enough. So what would define a true Christian? How do you know that you're a Christian? I want you to think, okay? I want you to, to just think about these things. What do you look for? in your experience, to tell you that, yes, I am a Christian, and this is true, and I'm on the right path. What do you look for? We look, and you know, we have different measuring sticks to determine if I'm a Christian, and then we take that same measuring stick, and we apply it to others. Whether it be the beliefs, whether it be the behavior, whether it be the practice, whether it be any of these things. A true Christian is really defined by what life they possess. Really. Do you have the life of Christ or you don't? It's that simple. If you have the life of Christ, you're a Christian. You don't have the life of Christ, you have an imitation. And what does the life of Christ mean? It is the only antidote to the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. In the failure of the presence of the life of Christ, you will develop the leaven of the Pharisees. Guaranteed. And this is what Jesus was warning his disciples about. This is one of the biggest problems in the church. And when I say in the church, I say in all the professed followers of Christ. Don't you realize that Jesus said in the last days, there will be many who will say unto him, Lord, Lord. Haven't we done all these things in your name? And what does he tell them? 
I never knew you. When he says many, is that a majority or a minority? And we might think that applies to all the other Christians who don't believe like us because we believe the truth. I have news for you. It's not based on beliefs. It's not even based on doing wonders. Jesus said many. The true heart motives. When do we truly take a look at the motives that drive our actions and decisions? We are so good at convincing ourselves of all the good Christian motives for the things we do and we mask so much selfishness and heart problems. you realize that? And to a lot of people, even the whole process of going so deep is so foreign, it's never been done. And so problems persist. Let's look at an example of that. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. Jesus said the biggest test for, or the biggest sign, Ephesians chapter 4 is where you're going, okay? The biggest sign for the world to see the truth of Christianity is what? He says, by this shall all men know, if what? If you love one another. We all know that, right? And so, well, this is one of the top things we know, we should love one another. Even if we don't feel like it but we better at least act like it, right? That happens sometimes, if we're honest, okay? You don't have to be honest with me, just be honest with yourself. Ephesians 4, 2 and 3. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This chapter talks about the unity of the Spirit, and later on in the chapter it talks about the unity of the faith. One of the other signs that Jesus gave is the unity that exists among the disciples will be an evidence of his presence among them. And so what happens many times as brethren, we read that and we say, well, let's be united. We have some differences. Let's unite together. And we call for meetings to have some unity. I've been in some of those meetings. Maybe you have too. And the unity that is sought is really a uniformity of Scriptural interpretation. That's really what it is. Let us unite in doctrinal faith, in teaching, and let's discuss these things and that. And while the attempt is good, many times the, the result of the meetings is worse off than when it started. So a meeting, a meeting for unity ends up in causing more disunity. I've been in enough of these meetings that when a brother or a sister come to me and say, look, let's have a, a, a unity meeting, I'll be honest, I groan inside. I say, oh, uh, spare me. I'll pass. What is it, brothers and sisters? There are man-made attempts to try and bring in a uniformity of doctrine without recognizing the precursor and the preparation for that. This is what this verse is talking about. It's talking about a unity of spirit. And then it tells us previously some of the elements that will hinder this unity of spirit that we need to endeavor to overcome. Some of these elements are pride, because it talks about lowliness and meekness, right? Endeavoring, you know, with all lowliness and meekness, so that's pride, the opposite. Long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. Bearing long with each other. Forbearing each other. What's forbearing each other mean? Patience, enduring each other. You ever had a brother or sister frustrate you? I have. I can put all hands up if I had more. Especially if this brother and sister is a little bit stubborn we try and share the truth with them. Or they're just not seeing what you're seeing. And Paul says, listen, remember something. You need to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What, what many times comes in the midst of the unity of the Spirit and disrupts that is, are these heart issues. Pride, frustration, alienation, and we don't have a unity of Spirit. And in that condition, we sit together and try and say, let's have a unity of faith. I can guarantee you the outcome before you meet, if that is the case. You know what I'm talking about. 
We are to seek earnestly that unity of the Spirit. And we can seek that not just by saying, oh, look, let's be united in the Spirit. It's by dealing with the heart issues that exist, the leaven of the Pharisees. That is our big problem. That is the hindrance to the unity of the Spirit, which if you don't have, forget about the unity of the faith. You just forget about that. You can keep trying. Good luck. Tell me about the results next time you see me. You know what I'm talking about, brothers and sisters? And, and, and we come with great hopes, high hopes to these things. And these hopes sometimes are very dashed. And you know what ends up happening? People are not just disappointed, but they're puzzled. Lord, why is this going on? What's happening? I thought we had the truth. That's how serious this issue is. So Jesus says to his disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. You know the Pharisees had so many factions and so many schools of thought and doctrine. Almost sounds like uh, some of us, right? This is the faction of the people who go attend their own mountain camp meeting. This faction over here. And there's another faction over there that don't come here. Just for example. Or some faction that goes with this particular teaching. This is all among people who believe the present truth, right? So many factions. And if we happen to cross paths or meet each other by accident, we put on the Christian mask. And the movie starts playing. Hey, brother. Hey, good to see you. And in our heart is another story. What's he doing here? What's going on here? You know, it's, oh, I wish I didn't run into him. I wish I came the other way or came late. <laughs> and despite our best efforts, sometimes the inner motives leak out behind the mask. There's issues like that, brothers and sisters. If, you, if you've been you know, a believer any length of time, you know what I'm talking about. And these issues prevent us from realizing that which God desires for us. That's why the apostle says, examine yourselves. Don't examine your brother or your sister. Examine yourselves. The motives of our heart. You know, selfishness, our root inherent human problem, is something that colors and permeates so much of our behavior, even as professed Christians. And I put it to you, that we have more Pharisees among us than there ever were in the days of Jesus. I'm just being honest. It might sound harsh. It might sound uh, alarming. I'm just being honest. And I think the evidence is apparent. Selfishness. Why do we even serve God? Some Christians are Christian because of the promise of heaven and eternal life. You can be a Christian for a selfish motive. You know that? And if you don't graduate and grow from maybe initially that might work, but if you don't graduate and grow from that, that's a problem. Because that selfishness will not only apply to that circumstance, it will also color all your other behavior and interaction with brothers and sisters as a Christian. And you will remain in this Christian movie. And in this movie, you are the star. You get the credit. You know, honestly, sometimes, I, I always used to wonder, these atheists that don't believe in God, don't they want to be in heaven? I just don't get it. Why would they choose a, a life that will only last 70, 80 years, and then afterward they say there's nothing? Why, why, why don't they just believe? You ever wondered that? To be honest, sometimes I think, I see the problem that they have. Maybe they don't want to be in heaven because they might not enjoy the company of all those people who are planning to be there. You know what I'm talking about? You want another honest fact? Sometimes I don't enjoy our own company because of some of these issues that happen. And you think, brothers and sisters, we're going to spend eternity in heaven. There are brothers and sisters who believe the truth who don't talk to each other. What are you going to do in heaven? Live on opposite sides? And this is, this is, if we're honest, sometimes, okay, this is apparent to us. Sometimes we turn, a, we turn a blind eye to it. It is very apparent to those who are looking on the unbelievers. And it causes a weakness in the body of Christ, and it discredits the truth we profess. How many times 
Have you had someone who doesn't believe the truth about God say, well, you guys look at you, this one here and this other one here and all these factions. Obviously, you don't believe the truth, right? Examine yourselves, the motives of our heart. One of the greatest tests, brothers and sisters, is how we feel towards our brothers and our sisters. Not how we treat them, because we can be pretty good at treating them at the way we should. I could read many, many verses to that end. I won't. But how we treat and how we feel towards each other, particularly when there is a difference of understanding or opinion or interpretation or doctrine. Because when we're talking about that outside with a brother, you know, the saying goes, God hates the sin but loves the sinner, right? And so we want to be like God, so we hate the error. We still love the brother or the sister. But before long, it so happens that our dislike for the error starts latching on to the brother or the sister themselves. You know what I'm talking about? And we develop certain feelings and certain, uh, you know, emotions. You know, sometimes we have disagreement with someone. I'll, I'll, I'll admit this, you know, with my wife, sometimes when we have issues, sometimes the issue is not the issue. You know what I'm talking about? Those of you who are married, if you have some issues, if you don't have them, okay, you don't know what I'm talking about, God bless you. But if you do know, <laughs> if you do happen to know, when you, know, you have some uh, altercation with your wife, and over some, something, I do, over some minor thing, but there's another issue in my mind that we had that we haven't really dealt with and settled, and the... Uh, the passion or the issue of that one infuses this one, and all of a sudden the little thing is so much bigger, right? When the issue is not the issue. Sometimes when we attempt to reconcile or have these unity meetings, brothers and sisters, the differences between us are not the issue. The doctrines are not the issue. They are the heart issues that separate us. And that's why even sometimes you might reach some statement that you can both mm, agree with, some wording of the doctrine that everyone, someone even at the back might reluctantly say, oh, okay, that's not going to hold us together. The issue sometimes is not the issue. We get caught up in dealing with the side issues, with other issues. The issues that we think that matter. Well, doctrine is important, but there's something so much more important. These heart issues, the leaven of the Pharisees. How do we feel towards each other? So I put it to you that I believe there's a lot of fakery that goes on among us. You might be faking it. I don't know. Because we're so, we've become adept. We've become, we've become really good at appearing right, saying the right phrases. Righteousness by faith. You know, it's like when we say righteousness by faith, that's it. Of course I, I believe and have righteousness by faith and all things associated with it. We do the right things. We say the right things. How is your heart? When was the last time you truly, in the private moments, between you and God, really examined your heart, the motives that drive your decisions, your actions, your brother, your sister. Why do you feel this way about him, about her? What really is in your heart? Is it really because they believe differently? Or is there a different belief, just an excuse to justify how you feel about them? And you think it's okay to alienate because they don't believe the truth. Well, that might be the apparent reason. But is it the real reason? That's the question. Let me share with you the statement that uh, is really insightful. This is from actually uh, this is from Spirit Prophecy, Signs of the Times, 1899. It's a short one. The secret of Satan's power over God's professed people. You want to know what that secret is? Lies in the deceitfulness of the human heart. The secret of Satan's power over God's professed people lies in, not in doctrinal error, not in heresy, not in what someone is preaching. Where does it lie? In the deceitfulness of the human heart. This is where the real problem is. That's where the leaven of the Pharisees lives. When was the last time you really examined your heart? The number one distinguishing feature 
of the deceitfulness of the human heart is that it is selfish. It is selfish. Selfishness is one of those things, brothers and sisters, that can easily be masked for something else. How many times have you honestly had a selfish motive that you convinced yourself that you did the thing because you're a Christian and it's the loving thing to do, but in reality it wasn't? The deceitfulness of the human heart is the secret of Satan's power. We talk about the big issues, you know, big sins, the horrific sins. There are just as deadly sins that we don't talk about as much. James mentions this. Let's go to James 4. I'll just uh, mention a couple here as we close. James 4 and verse 6. Just as deadly, but they go by unnoticed and sometimes undetected. James 4, 6, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Are you proud? Don't say no or yes, just, just think. I'll tell you why. Look, I had one, one time testimony time, you know, before, before church, and, and this brother got up, and honestly, I, I, I was, it, it, I just use this as an illustration, not as a condemnation. But he was telling us about how proud, uh, sorry, how humble he was, and I honestly concluded, this guy is proud of his humility. Honestly, he went on and on about how humble he is and, and he did this and look how humble. And can't you guys see he's humble? And I honestly came to the conclusion, this guy is proud of how humble he is. And sometimes that is the case. Maybe with you, maybe with me. We know we should be humble. The scripture says that and we take certain pride in the fact that we are humble. The Bible says here God deals with such an attitude how? He resists the proud. Elsewhere in the scripture, pride is called an abomination. Sometimes you try and seek out after God, and you think God is not hearing you. Have you ever wondered maybe that one of the reasons might be because your behavior, the issues in your heart are causing God to resist you? It puts a barrier between you and God. And I know we're really good at masking pride. I know that. I don't need to ask. Nobody acts proud. We all act humble. So how is it in your heart? Pride is not just, I feel proud, pride of opinion, pride of interpretation, spiritual pride because you believe the truth and someone else doesn't. And we're good at, at presenting our pride humbly. Oh, this brother doesn't believe. He's a, yeah. And the unsaid is in the heart, but I do, praise God. Right or wrong? And, and, and this attitude, you know, that's, that's a sign of this Phariseeism, this leaven of the Pharisees being present. We look at a brother or we look at a sister and, and we, we quickly make a judgment. We see them eating something, we see them wearing something, we see them believing something, we see them doing whatever. And straight away in the computer, t -t 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 -t, we place them where they are spiritually. Right? And then next to that, straight away, this is all unconscious. We're so good at this, it happens automatically. And then we probably, like that Pharisee who prayed, Lord, I thank you that I'm not doing that. <laughs> That's pride. Beware. God resists the proud. James 5, 9 is another one. James chapter 5 and verse 9. He says here, Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest he be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Judging is one of these identifying marks of a Pharisee. Grudging against another, murmuring and groaning against another brother or a sister in our heart. Alienation between a brother or a sister. These are heart matters, brothers and sisters. And I honestly believe we have no hope of reaching a true, genuine unity of the Spirit if we continue to ignore these issues. Now, I'm not the one who goes around and checks on your heart. That's your job. 
individually, we are to examine our hearts so that we can maintain this unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. James chapter 4. A lot of verses from James today. James chapter 4, verse 11. Here is something that we don't do. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. Interesting, who is he speaking? Who is he writing all this stuff to? To the Christians. These are the issues, the problems that Christians need to be mindful of, these heart issues that manifest in such behavior. The leaven of the Pharisees is not a problem for people who don't believe in Christ. It's a problem for the Christians. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. Speaking evil of a brother or sister. Do we do that? We hate a brother or a sister in our hearts sometimes. The Bible says hating a brother or a sister is murder. We might have very good reason to do so. But these heart issues, brothers and sisters, are serious. Forget about trying to mask them under the category of oh, doctrinal debate, or oh, he's preaching heresy, or oh, he doesn't believe this, and thereby justify hatred and animosity and alienation in our hearts. Because really, we have pride and selfishness. These are just as deadly sins, brothers and sisters, as the big sins, the theft and the murder and, and, and the things that are and that we class as outrageous. James chapter 5 and verse 16. James chapter 5 and verse 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that he may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We like the last part of the verse, but the first part of the verse is no less important. When was the last time you did that? Confess your faults one to another. Some of these things, some of these issues between brothers and sisters. When was the last time you actually went to a brother, went to a sister, and said, look, I need to confess something. And, and look, just to clarify, confession here is not the go confess your sins to like a priest type thing. Go confess your faults. These issues, heart issues you have with your brethren, go and sort them out together, James says. Why? And pray for one another that you may be healed. What kind of healing? Both spiritual and therefore physical as well. So this has to do with some of these issues, brothers and sisters. When was the last time you went to a brother and sister and you actually said, look, let's, let's, let's pray together, I'm sorry. You might think, well, I'm waiting for the brother, he hasn't come yet. I'm, I'm right here, they know my number. No, no, when was the last time you went? Now I know you might be the one who was wronged. I know that. But what does it say here? You can seek that. If you know a brother or a sister has something against you, why don't you seek to reconcile? Because you know what? These issues left untreated and unresolved, they grow into heart issues, alienation, and hatred. When John writes to the readers of his uh, epistle, if you hate a brother in your heart, you're a murderer. These are converted Christians, right? Why is he telling them that? Isn't that obvious? Because these are issues that are real. These are issues that will arise if we are not careful because of the deceitfulness of the human heart. So I want you to look at your experience as a Christian, as a believer. And I want you to see if you can notice any growth. If you've been a Christian any length of time, look back on your experience as part of your examination and see, have you been growing? Have some of these issues that you struggle with, have they been resolving? Are you obtaining victory over them and they're behind you? Are you still struggling with the same things? You're still in the same place maybe as a year ago, two years ago, 20 years ago maybe. How is your Christian walk? Because if you're not growing, 
Brothers and sisters, you have a problem. If you're not growing in grace, there is a problem. When Jesus says he is the vine and you are the branches, what does the branch do as it's attached to the vine from year to year? It grows, it bears fruit. If it stays the same thing all the time, what ends up happening is the husbandman has to snip it off. How is your experience and how is my experience? No wonder Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. So I want to challenge you with this. And I know for some of you this is a hard saying, but I have to say, if this spirit is convicting you in your heart, especially with this verse that we just read, if you have an issue with a brother or a sister that you know of, that's even possibly here, you know the right thing to do. Isn't that right? You know, I'm going to think, oh, I was hoping you wouldn't say that. I'm not saying it. The scripture says. You cannot afford, brothers and sisters, to carry these things. These things are what causes the alienation and separation. And it's not always just over doctrine. It's not always just over beliefs. There are deep heart issues that need resolving. Now, I know that there are different character traits of people. And some characters of people don't get along with each other. They just rub each other the wrong way. I'm aware of all of that. But in as much as lies in you to undo this deceitfulness of the human heart, by God's help, seek the Lord's strength and go to your brother, go to your sister and see if you need to resolve something and pray together so that you may be healed. We don't do that enough. And like I said, I know you might be not the one at fault. Because every man's way is right in his own eyes. Whatever your situation or your circumstances. So, let's close with this verse. 1 John chapter 3. This is our last passage. We'll close with this. 1 John chapter 3. Verses 20 to 22. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 20. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence towards God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. If listening to this, you have an inkling in your heart where there's a circumstance that applies to you. That's not me doing that. That's God's Spirit touching your heart. We're looking at God's Word. God's Word is the effective revealer of the secrets of the heart. And so I pray that you will heed that. Because what John is talking about here also has to do with prayer and God hearing us. You ever wonder why sometimes God doesn't hear us? The problem is not on God's end. The problem many times is on our end. Not just on our end, maybe you have enough faith or all. Actually, it might be some of these issues that are outstanding between you as a brother and a sister. You realize that? And this is John, of course, writing as the maturest John. I find it really interesting if you notice that the Gospel of John gives us the details of what to believe. Christ, his work as the Savior. In the letters of John, he deals more with the heart issues that a Christian will face and has to also deal with. He's not dealing with doctrine, he's dealing with heart issues. He's dealing with love, how you treat each other, and all of these things. As he matured, as he became an elder, these are the things he noticed and he observed that he needs to encourage the believers with. And so, how do you examine yourself? So I want to challenge you with this, brothers and sisters, to make a decision today, to make a commitment today, not just to examine yourself, but if there's something that the Lord reveals to you, to do something about it. There's a lot more that could be said, but I think you see the point. If we want to be where God wants us to be, if we want that unity, if we want that power, if we want all of these things that we're talking about, it will never happen while these things are not addressed. That's my challenge to you today. If you are able, let's kneel and we'll close with a word of prayer.